Right, welcome back everybody. Back to the second part of David's evening. Um, I say David's evening rather than David's talk or anything like that. Um, because I'm not too sure from any given time what he's coming up with. So, um, right, I'll just catch up with one or two people that I've seen popped up. Uh, uh, where was he, Neil, in the first half? Um, you know, you've missed... Uh, You've missed half of the evening, so um, that's just not good enough. Slap on the back of the wrist. Good evening to everybody else. <coughs> and I would just like to say, if um, Vera's listening, we do have a new member who's joined. <coughs> uh, her name's Vera. If you are listening and you are signed in, Vera, then... Just let us know that you're there by dropping a short comment in the chat. So uh, everybody's popping in very quickly now. So um, <laughs> I like your comment, Neil. That's very good. Mercy mission. So um, I'll, I'll let you off just this, this time. Paul was very quick today. I think that's his first time on the uh, front row. Um of the auditorium so well done to you paul it's uh good to see you right we're going to be joining um david again in a second or two so i'll just make him full screen again so you can see david in his um full splendor so without further ado <coughs> I'll just hand you over to David. I'm sure he'll do the same as I'm doing. Just uh, waffle for two or three minutes uh, just whilst the rest of us get joined. Just for you, David, we're up to 14. Uh, we're up to 16, actually. And last session we had about 25. So we've got one or two to join us yet. Over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everybody that came back from the first half. I didn't scare you off with the, uh, the lovely Corpus Olympus. Uh, pre presentation. Uh, thanks for coming back. And uh, as, as uh, Graham said, a couple of uh, people that joined us that weren't in the first half. So you've come for a good bit, which is good. Um, this bit, I really stickly, I, what I wanted to do is I, I am going to talk a little bit about some of the Olympus features that I use because I use them. I think it's important to, for you to know that I do use them, but it's important for you to know why I use them as well in comparison to more traditional methods that I perhaps used to use. Uh, some of the things are still the same. So I'm going to be talking about some of the macro shots that I've taken. Um, some of the principles, a lot of the principles of macro photography are very much still the same, but there are some good features that I use now that save me a lot of time uh, in the long run at doing things. Uh, I'll show you some of the images. I'll talk through how the images were made in various different ways. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is just pop a, a quick demonstration on of, 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 a, of a macro focus bracket um, and then show you what I then do with the images from there on, on my MacBook. Uh, so hopefully that will uh, keep us entertained for the next, uh, what have we got, 45 minutes, Graham? That is totally up to you, David. Okay, three hours it is then. We'll be here for a while. I'll get I'll, I'll I'll get the drinks ordered in, and we'll be here for a couple more hours. That's right. Um, well, you're up to twenty two now, so you probably you're welcome to start whenever you're ready. Excellent stuff. Okay, so let's make a start on that, and we'll have a look at some stuff. So, uh, first things first, uh, when it comes to macro photography, it is really really important that we know, <coughs> excuse me, the difference between macro and close up photography. Now, I'm not one of the purists that will shout at you if you take a close up photo and call it macro when it's not actually macro. I, I don't mind at all. Uh, but the actual definitions of macro photography is something that sits at what we call a one to one ratio or greater. Now, what one to one ratio means for those of you that don't know is if you take a picture of something, let's say, for example, a five pence coin, uh, then the, the resulting image of that five pence coin will fill the frame uh, in exactly the same space as it would do if you physically placed that five pence coin on your imaging sensor. Now, don't go putting 5p coins on your imaging sensor because it's not going to do them any good whatsoever. But that's what one-to-one -one ratio actually means. So we're shooting at, at life size as it would appear if we laid it on the sensor. 
So one to one ratio or greater is macro. And then we get up to something like 20 to one uh, where we're then in micro uh, photography territory, which is a whole different ball game. It's not something that we're going to go into today. Uh, so in order to do macro photography, you do need a macro lens. Now you can use a lot of lenses to get close up, uh, but to do one-to-one -one or greater, you generally need a macro lens. And I use a 60 millimeter one-to-one uh, -one macro lens on the Olympus range. That equates to 120 millimeters on full frame uh, focal length. So it's a really nice focal length to work with because it means I can get a bit of distance away from the more aggressive insect species, uh, wasps mainly, things like that. Uh, generally speaking, I'm not that too bothered about getting up close to them, but uh, they get a bit panicky if you get too close. So it's nice to have that distance. So the 60mm is the one that I use. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple of images real quickly. So bear with me. Just going to bring up uh, a single shot. So just to give you an idea of a single shot here, uh, and hopefully this will come across well. I'm sure Graham will be able to tell me if it comes across not so well. Mm. So fine. what we're looking at there, are we seeing the full screen there, Graham? Yes, fine. Just so that everybody knows, if you were here in the first half and I told you about the fan that was going on, I've now turned that fan off. I had that discussion with Graham just there in the break and the, <laughs> the temperature has started to rise in this room. So I'm sorry about my shiny head. Uh, so let's get back to the picture. So this is a single macro shot taken on the 60 millimeter macro on the EM1 Mark II. This would have been shot at f5.6 because it's my preferred f-stop on that 60 mil macro. It's the sharpest point. Um, and it's given us that nice, nice soft uh, uh, sort of creamy background, that, uh, that out of focus uh, bokeh there in the background. And then the ants, uh, the particular one that I've uh, focused on is this one here. So if I zoom this, you should be able to see uh, that that was the point that I focused on for this image, okay? And it's a nice opportunist single shot of some ants on a fuchsia. Uh, nice and clean, 60 millimeter macro. Now you'll see that there is some light in there, there is some highlights in there. And that came from uh, the STF-8 flash that I use, which is a twin head macro flash just here. So this has two heads on it and these heads can be swizzled around and that connects up to my camera. Uh, and I can either use that in TTL or in full manual mode. And that's what I would have used for that shot to enable me to see that. Single shots are great, and most of my macro photography will comprise of single macro shots like this with that nice kind of creamy background and a fade through in the depth of the field. David, David. Yes. Very quick one. The STF-8, can or could members use it on a non-Olympus camera? Is it something that can be set? So, yeah, I mean, I've heard of users using it on the Panasonic range. Um, the downside of using it on anything full frame is that the lenses tend to be too big and you don't have the adaption rings that sit on the front of the lens because this ring actually sits on the front of the 60 mil macro, it screws on. So, so unless you have a different way to attach that to the front of a, another system's lens, if it's not micro four thirds, then uh, it would be quite difficult. But obviously because Panasonic bodies will take a 60 mil macro, you could use that on a Panasonic body um, quite easily. But yeah. you know, on other systems, it's about how you attach that front ring to the front of that system's macro lens. Yeah, a couple of questions. Jill, yeah. Jill's just saying, do you always use flash for your macro, David? Uh, no, not always, but 80% of the time, I would say I probably use flash. Um, I will bring up an image for you where I didn't use flash. So uh, let me stop sharing this one here. Um, and I will bring up one where I didn't do, and you can still achieve very, very nice things with it. So this is a single image. Again, it's a single shot as well. It's not another, it's not a stack. These are the singles. So this one here was done in natural light, <clears throat> um, out in the garden. Believe it or not, it hadn't been raining. That's a cheat. I always carry a little spray bottle of water with me to add a little bit of detail to some of the flowers and, and things that, that are out there. So this is sprayed on separately. It was a very dry day, to be honest with you. Um, but that, again, single shot, no flash on that one. So the only with the reflection that you're seeing in those drops of water is from the sky. And that's the only light that was coming in there. Mm. But again, shot at f5.6 on the 60 mil macro lens. Yeah. Another question that's coming from Graham. Um, 
Graham says, David, I'm getting more into macro now. The 60 millimeter, 2.8, of course, because he's got the yeah. Olympus system. And he, he has an LED panel plus reflector, as I prefer to see the light shadows on my subject first. What advantage might he gain from using the STF-8? That's uh, a really, really good question, Graham. So uh, I get exactly what you're saying about seeing the light and shadows on the subject, and you can kind of reflect that composition in your mind before you take that shot. Uh, very similar to the problem of flash photography in a studio with a model, is you don't know what the light's going to fall on the model like until you release the flash. Um, the benefits of having a flash or an STFA on top of that is obviously one, the strength of the light that's involved because the flash power will always be stronger than your LED light unless you're carrying around a huge bank of LED lights. So initially the flash power is something that you will gain from. Uh, and also the speeds that that can then allow your shutter to achieve uh, is going to be higher. You can use high speed sync with those things as well. So you can get a much higher shot to freeze uh, the movement in macro. So again, that's another benefit. Um, also, it'd be more about the spread of light. So an LED panel generally spreads light, it scatters it quite widely. Uh, and a flash, particularly the STFA, has got tiny little heads that can be, if I just take the diffuser off one of these, these tiny little heads here they can be tilted backwards and forwards and direct the light in a more suitable manner, as well as being able to shift it around the ring and create texture from a light direction. So those are the benefits of using a flash over an LED light. Uh, but a lot of people will still prefer to use an LED light for various different reasons. Now, I'm going to be using an LED light when I do a little demonstration for you in a minute, because... Um, one of the downsides of using flash with focus stacking or focus bracketing is that it does restrict the shutter speed to a 50th of a second, no faster. You can go slower, but you can't go faster than a 50th. So <clears throat> as a result, bracketing 150 shots at a 50th of a second whilst waiting for your flash to recycle can take longer than your subject stays still. Uh, so an LED light in that situation would be much better. Now the reason why I'm using it in the studio tonight is because my subject is a peacock feather and flash light and LED light give different results on iridescent feathers. So a flash tends to suck a lot of the color out of an iridescent uh, feather but an LED light would produce a much more um, realistic color tone. So, yeah, ups and downs. It varies depending on the subject there, Graham. So just for any, um, uh, how can I put it, just for any member, if they use a flash on their camera, Canon, Nikon, whatever, is it best just to use it through the ETTL, or is it best to set the teach yourself to to set the flash to a lower power level if you get what i mean yeah so <clears throat> it depends on what you're shooting for the best part if you're out there and you want quick shots then use the the ttl functionality in your flash and just be aware that you've got flash compensation on top of that so if you if your camera uh, <clears throat> and flash combine and they release a shot and the flash power is too bright or too dark versus what you want to achieve, you can use the flash compensation real quickly to overall underexpose with flash. Um, and that's a nice quick way to do it. You can do that for 95% of the work that you do. The 5% of the work where I would say you really have to learn how to program your flash manually would be when it comes to, 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 to focus bracketing and stacking because the flash needs to be consistent for every single shot. So every shot needs the same amount of power applied to it. Now, TTL might vary that between shots, which is going to give you an inconsistent uh, amount of images, which when you then process is not going to look right. So when you focus stack or bracket, you need to use your manual flash uh, and give it a, a defined flash output so that every image is the same. Right. Another question that's just come in. Jim's just said, is it possible to use the... STF-8 on the Panasonic 30 millimeter lens. If you can't answer the question, do you know the thread size on the STF-8? STF yes, yes. So I don't know the thread size on that Panasonic lens, but the adapter, the, the STF-8 comes with two adapter rings. One is 46 millimeters, 
which is which on our system is the 60 mil and the 30 mil macro on Olympus. And it also comes with a 62 millimeter adapter ring, which fits on the 12 to 40 Pro and all of the 1.2 primed as well. Lovely, thanks very much. Okay. Yeah. Right, so uh, let's have a look at some more images. So these are the single shot images there. Let's stop sharing that one there and bring us back. Uh, I'm going to bring up a couple more images to show you how we progress then. So I'll show you a stack that was done in camera. Uh, so this is one that this is this is actually the final JPEG that came out of the camera. It's had no external editing done to it whatsoever. Um, it's straight out of camera. And here we go. So this is a focus stack of a hoverfly um, in camera with the resulting JPEG that that creates. So the in-camera focus stacking for me will take uh, up to 15 raw files uh, and produce a final JPEG image that's all stacked together. Now you can see here where the very definitive end uh, of that, if I use my mouse, I'm pretty sure you can see that as well, we can see quite a definitive end to where the stacking process stopped just there behind the hoverfly's head. Um, and this is where you then start to consider whether or not you need to step above in camera stacking, uh, which other cameras do, I know the Z series from Nikon does it as well. Um, and do you want to then go to bracketing to then achieve that full depth that you would have seen there? Or are you trying to achieve something like that nice drop in the focus, that nice blurred background? It's then going to be dependent on what your vision of the image becomes. Uh, so for me, I generally will then go for most things to actual stacking. I either go from a single shot, a one shot uh, image that just has that narrow depth of field, or I go the whole hog and I do a bracket of you know, 100, 150, 200 images. Um, so that then moves us to our next shot. Um, and we'll have a look at this one. Let's take it away from insects a little bit. Let's bring this into the floral world and we'll have a little look at this one here. So this is a beautiful red rose. And again, those droplets are completely added in extra, the handy little spritz bottle. Um, and this one was shot with off camera flash as well. So this is a stack of only about 25 shots, to be honest with you, uh, to go through the petals and, and the rose heart as it is. Um, and what I did with this one is that I have two off-camera flashes that I trigger from a trigger on my camera, uh, and they kind of sit uh, facing each other with the rose in, in the middle, but the rose is covered by a, a diffusion tunnel. And now I make uh, diffusion tunnels out of one of two things, either old polystyrene cups, you know, that you used to get a cup of tea from in a roadside services, uh, because they're not very environmentally friendly. So recycling those that are still available is a good idea. Uh, and I use a polystyrene cup with the bottom uh, cut out of it. Uh, and I have my subject kind of sitting in there. The flash fires through the polystyrene, creating a really soft, scattered light that you see there. And the other way that I do it as well is I create longer tunnels with packing foam, thin sort of uh, five millimeter packing foam that you can get on rolls and I just create a tunnel and I tape it to my working surface uh, put the subject inside and then again fire the flash through that because diffusion is super key if you're doing studio macro work like that now obviously you can't take a lot of these things out in the field you can take small diffusion systems like you know, bits of board and card and paper that you can hold in front of your flash. Uh, but for this kind of thing where the subject's in a little studio set up at home, the diffusion tunnel is really, really important. And that helps me get the really, really nice crisp colors, uh, soft gradients on the edges. We'll just zoom in on this one a little bit. Uh, and the really nice kind of beautiful sharpness uh, that you can achieve from stacking sort of 25 images separately. Uh, so that's the next step for me from focus stacking. I'm making sure that I apply that that diffusion uh, method as well, because I can't stress enough uh, that diffusion is absolute key. Uh, I'm just going to stop sharing that and see if I can find uh, an image for you that didn't get diffused very well. And I, I probably can't because I tend to bin them if they're that terrible. Uh, let's have a quick look and see if there's one in here that's not diffused very well. Um, do, do, do. No, I've got a funny feeling that I would have absolutely binned all of them that didn't diffuse very well. Uh, so you're just gonna have to take it from me that diffusion is key. Oh, hang on, is this one? Uh, yeah, okay, no, this one is uh, sort of, the diffusion could have been better on this one. So I'm gonna show you this one. Um, 
this is a little B. So, and you can see there that the, the diffusions works quite well, but I've obviously missed something on the right side uh, on over the eye. I've got really, really coarse, harsh, uh, uh, specular highlights there. If I zoom in a little bit, it has meant that I've lost quite a bit of detail in that eye. And it's an overpowering feeling of highlights just in there. So that diffusion could have been better. But on this side, the diffusion works very, very well. If we look at the antennae, I've got nice soft gradients and I've maintained the detail, which is key to that one. He was a really cute little bumblebee. I remember this one, actually. He was a proper little fluff ball uh, and very, very friendly as well. Uh, okay, so yeah, diffusion is absolutely key for that one. I'm sorry, I'm sweating so much. It must be it must be horrible. If you see me dripping with water, I do apologise. I'm sure I'm sure a lot of you are in the same boat there, uh, of being too super warm. Um, so so let's have a little look at before I go and give you a little demonstration. Let's have a look at one more image. Um, I think I'll show you. Uh, I've got two for you. So, okay, this is a really good example of, uh, I think it was Graham's question about LED lights, okay? So you can use LED lights, but you might suffer uh, something from the LED lights. And I'm going to show you one of my images that does suffer from that. Uh, let's just share the screen. Yeah. So this is a moth uh, that has been squirted with ice cold water to make him stop. Okay, so the ice cold water just makes him stop for a few seconds uh, and then I can take a picture of him. Um, and then once the water warms up and he warms up, he tools off on his way, which is a really, really good way to, to shoot these things. But I shot this with two LED light panels. This was quite early on in my experiments with focus bracketing uh, with Olympus or just automatic focus bracketing as opposed to using what would be the old fashioned way of a macro rail and either hand cranking it uh, to take photos at different focus points or having it controlled by an electronic mechanism. That's the old fashioned way of doing it, which a lot of people still do now. But as a result of moving to the Olympus system, it's now all automated uh, in the camera. I don't even need to touch it. And this was one of my early experiments with doing that. And it was with the twin LED lights. And you can see the reflection of those pinprick LEDs in the water. Okay, so that's one of the downsides, Graham, that you might think about when shooting with LED lights is that you can get those reflections. And again, it just goes to show that diffusion it really is key because that could be diffused out. Um, but it's still super hard to diffuse LED lights because you've got a whole load of, of pinpricks of light emitting areas. So it's quite difficult. Just a quick question that's come in. Doreen, yeah. Doreen says... Did you shoot the bees in the wild or do you get them from indoors that have come indoors and then just uh, shoot them um, then? Uh, that is a very, very good question, Doreen. Uh, so a bit of both. Um, if a bug has come into my conservatory and expired, for example, if I go into the conservatory in the morning and there are dead insects sitting there on the on the windowsills, as I'm sure you've all experienced, and yes, I will use those to take pictures and and to create images with. Um, more of if 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 I've got a shot of a bug that's alive, like the fluffy little bumblebee or this fellow here, they're generally out there in the wild. Uh, they're in situ doing their thing. Um, this moth would have been in the evening and he would have been outside in the garden somewhere or on the conservatory flapping around trying to get in. Um, the bumblebee was in the garden as well, uh, nicely in the wild. The only insects that I shoot indoors are ones that have already expired. So yeah, it's again, it's, it's recycling again. Uh, it's a good way to experiment and to learn is to go and find yourself a dead fly on a windowsill that's already kind of past its best. Um, I, in, in no way, shape or fall, form, condone any type of putting bugs in freezers or purposely expiring them for the, for the purposes of taking a photograph. I don't condone that at all. So try and take as many of your bug in, insect pictures in the wild. Uh, if, if not, then obviously if they've expired, you know, they, they've already done their bit and, and run their cycle. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, I've got a bit of a frog there. It must be passing from you, Graham. I've caught it from you. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so, so then we're going to go on to the next step. Uh, we'll stop showing that one, and we will pull up a serious bracket. I'll show you the first one. This is an expired bug. This is a crane fly. So he was expired on the windowsill, uh, and I have managed to pose him in such a way with my diffusion light, uh, my light diffusion tunnel, which is my phone packing and two uh, uh, flash side by side 
Um, I've just realised I didn't share that with you. I'm talking away about it. I was, <laughs> I just, about, I was just about to say that. <laughs> I haven't even shared the image. There we go. Now you can see the image. So here's the crane fly in my diffusion uh, tunnel with flash firing either side. Lovely, lovely, soft, scattered light. Uh, and the background is what most people ask me about. So when it comes to shooting with backgrounds in the studio, you can use whatever you want. It doesn't matter. You can pull pages out of a magazine because it's going to be so out of focus, you're really only concerned with the colors. This background is the Sugar Puffs Honey Monster cereal box that was the closest thing to hand when I shot it. And I quite like the, uh, the red and the yellow because that's the Honey Monster's mouth on the cereal box. Uh, and that's all it is. Really simple, nicely out of focus, uh, lovely gradient of colors because of that. Uh, and it goes quite well. So this shot was, uh, I believe, 180 single images. Um, on the 60 millimeter macro with a set of extension tubes. Okay, so we've now gone up to adding extension tubes into it to get closer and get greater magnification. Uh, and this would have been a 10 and a 20, uh, 10 and a 16 extension tube. They sit together to create 26 millimeters of extension between your lens and your camera body. And by doing that, it enables you to focus closer on your subject. But as a result, you lose depth of field massively, which is why you go to the uh, bracketing and, and stack all those together afterwards. So you're about 160 images uh, for this one. Uh, but it always amazes me how something like a crane fly can, can have so much detail and such great design in terms of a, of a living uh, organism, uh, in terms of how they're built and how they're made. Uh, and we can just look at them in much more detail like that. So are you using a macro rail or how are you achieving those fine little movements? So as I said earlier, I, I used to use a macro rail when I used the DSLR for many, many years. Uh, to shoot one subject, it would probably take me somewhere around two and a half hours uh, to shoot the 160 images through one subject on a macro rail. Now with the Olympus system, I don't need to because it's got a focus bracketing system, which means that I set it up on a tripod with my subject. Uh, I give it the nearest point to me that I want in focus as a starting point. I program how many images I want it to take into the system and I hit the shutter button. It will then automatically take that amount of images, shifting the focal point incrementally through the image, depending on what I've programmed in. Uh, and it's all automatic, simple. And in two and a half hours, I could probably shoot six or seven subjects. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very quick. Yeah. Uh, so one more image to show you. <coughs> And then I will do a little demonstration, not on an insect, sadly, um, because they're all flying about outside today. So this last one, again, another expired. Uh, which one shall I show you? This one's quite a good one, because again, we've got a nice background for it. Um, let's do this. Okay, so this is Vespa, the wasp. Um, again, expired. So this is one that I've collected from the uh, conservatory windowsill. Uh, quite fresh, so not a lot of fluff on him because they do get fluff on them after a couple of hours. They attract kind of dust and things like that. Um, you can clean them in supersonic cleaners if you're using the dead specimens. Um, but if you if you get to them quick enough, then you can generally find them quite clean. Again, this would be in a diffusion tunnel with two flashes on the side. This one is 200 images. Um, and again, it allows us to get the detail uh, on the uh, on the eye, the detail on the carapace, and you can see in things like the armor that a wasp has on it uh, is pretty phenomenal. Again, it's just about seeing life that we don't normally see. Like we all know what a wasp looks like, but in reality, we really don't know what a wasp looks like at all um, because they're so kind of. Um, structured and complex. Uh, and like I said, that would be right up there around the sort of 200 mark in terms of shots. And again, the background, I believe if I remember rightly that one, I ripped it out of a copy of Digital Photographer. Somebody had made a nice photo and I quite like the color, so I ripped it out and placed it in the background and that's what it gave me. Uh, nice and easy. So on your um, starting position for your um, stack. Yes. On the bracketing, where do you start on the bracketing? Is it in the nearest point, the center point? So 
if you stack it in camera, you need to find a point that's about 30% into the subject that you want, want all in focus because it will jump back towards you and go further away. So your starting point is about 30 or 40% in. For bracketing, you're always choosing the closest point to you that you want in focus. And in this example, it would have been the tip of one of these wings here because that's obviously closer to me in reality. And it works from there away from you until it runs out of shots or until you interrupt the process and stop it. Yeah, yeah. I just noticed a couple of comments in. Yeah. Um, Doreen said, how do you train them to stay? You don't. You put cold water on them. You, you don't. Moths are really easy. If you spray a moth with, with ice cold water, it will just sit. And it does take them a good sort of two, three minutes to warm up again before they fly. And it doesn't do them any harm whatsoever because all it does is it replicates nighttime temperatures where they would normally sleep anyway. One of our members, Steve, he's really, really big into his moths. And uh, he's put um, that the better ones to uh, go for are the hawk moths. They tend to, tend to stay steadier for longer so yes so there are lots of different types of insect that have different behavioral patterns as well and steve's right with some of the moths then it will change um i do apologize it's going to get a little bit noisy as tesco unload for my neighbors uh, <laughs> grocery shopping i'm not closing up <laughs> on those guys i'm sorry um but yes yeah, certain different insects have different behavior uh certain insects will stay still for you if you shine a light on them certain ones will, will run and leg it if you shine a light on them water can help um, you know different things interestingly if you want to shoot jumping spiders the teeny tiny jumping spiders that just sort of crumble across your wall uh, they will look at a light so if you have a little tiny pen torch above your camera as you're shooting it they will stop and they'll look up at the light for you uh, and they can be controlled really really well the part of being a macro photographer if you want to shoot insects is that you really have to get to grips with some of the sort of science and biology around them you need to get to know your subjects you need to read up on them you know you need to look into the uh, the etymology uh, of it and then you'll learn once you learn more about the subject you'll learn what you're looking for on their bodies different features you'll learn how they react in different environments you'll learn what time of the days they come out and what time they go to sleep so uh, you do have to do a bit of research into into what you're you're shooting it is better if you're interested in in insect species to take macro yeah um a question for somebody who hasn't asked the question yeah <laughs> um bob is our chairman is one who likes to once he takes the macro shots of the insects he does like to identify them so that he can name them when he puts them on the Dunham Camera Club website do you have a good reference place to reference the insects and the moths etc so actually there's a couple of really good apps out there if you've got a smartphone um and you can take a picture of the insect you can take a picture of the picture that you've taken and it will go online and reference it and come back with the species and genus of, of insect that you've found but there are a couple out there so if you just go onto your your app store whatever app store you use and just search uh insect identifier uh, or species identifier, then a couple will come back. Uh, normally the top ones are the safest ones to go with, but there are lots of resources for that out there. And all you do is take a quick snap with your smartphone and it goes through and tries to find the best match for the species. Right, thank you. There you go, Bob. You know where to look. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Uh, okay, so let's pull that image back now. I'm going to do a real quick uh, uh, bracketing demonstration. Now, sadly, I can't show you the actual process of it being bracketed, but I'm going to show you uh, what my camera is set up to do. Uh, I'll then unplug the leads, and you'll have to look at my face again for a few seconds while I take the bracketed shots. Then I've got some pre-taken uh, shots. They're exactly the same on my MacBook here, and I'll show you how I drop them into uh, Helicon Focus, which is the simplest program ever to use, okay? Uh, I just wipe my brow again and take a little drink of water because I feel like dehydration is definitely the danger of this evening for probably most of us, actually, including Graham, who is sat in his office sweating away as well because he's so very kindly given his air conditioning to his lovely lady. Uh, okay, so let's just pop this back on here. I've just given things away there. I'm just showing Graham to be a nice guy. He's got that, that mean exterior now. He's not really. He's given the fans the other half there. Uh, okay, so let's see if this will work. 
transfer over my feed, uh, and then you should see a camera view of what I see with some settings around the edges and a very out of focus image just there. Now, uh, I've got my 60mm macro on there. I've got an LED light on a, on a peacock feather. Um, I'm just very quickly going to check because my camera has manual focusing assistance. So I'm just going to go into there and I'm going to make sure that my focus peaking, which helps me see what's in focus manually, is on. Yes, it is. Uh, and that means that when I start to bring this into focus, do, 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 I will get a flash of color run across my subject where my point of focus is. There we go. So that's that lovely yellow flash of color telling me that I've got my focus just right. Now I'm doing bracketing, so I need to start the focusing here uh, at the nearest point to me that I want in focus. Okay, so I'm just going to start it there. Uh, F5.6 on the 60mm macro because that's the one that I like. I'm just going to reduce the shutter speed now to get a slightly better ISO because this LED light could be brighter. Um, so here we are, a 40 of a second. I've got a remote shutter release in my hand, uh, and I'm just going to unplug that now, which will activate my bracketing because it doesn't go through the screen. So I just switch it over to me so you can see me for a second there. I'm looking at my camera. It says bracketing is active. I'm going to press it now, and I've programmed it for 50 shots, and I'm going to tell you when it starts and when it stops so that you can gauge how long that 50 shots is taken. Okay, so I'm going to go now, and it's going through the sequence to take 50 shots. And it's finished. That's it. Very, very quickly to take the 50 shots. Now I can plug my camera back in. And once that sees it, there we go, cross back over. <coughs> Excuse the sound of Tesco's van outside. Uh, I can then show you the sequence of images. So this is the last image it took where it ended right at the top of the subject. And if I just press left to scroll through my sequence of playback, you'll see that focal plane skimming all the way down there through the peacock feather, all the way back to the start. And that is my series of images uh, that I have now taken all in raw. Uh, each individual image will be very, very highly detailed. Okay, so on the focal point of each individual image, we can see that really heavy detail in that peacock feather. Uh, beautiful, beautiful fibers. Now, oops, I can't quite cross that over. That's it done. That is literally 50 images bracketed. So most of what you're doing, if you're doing insects or flowers or things in the macro studio, most of the time involved will be your setup and getting your subject in the right place and everything else. The actual physical process of that bracketing happening is over and done with very, very quickly. Now, obviously, if you're using flash, it's going to be take a little bit longer because you're limited to a 50th of a second shutter speed and that flash needs to recycle the charge ready to go off the next time. So it does take a little bit longer. Um, big, big tip, if you're going to use flash for bracketing uh, and you are anything like me, if you've slightly, ever so slightly sensitive eyes or anything else like that, is set it running and leave the room because this is going to flash, you know, a lot. If you set that to 100 images or 200 images, that's going to flash 100, 200 times. Um, that's going to make you feel unwell if you're in that room seeing it. So best thing is to start it, leave the room, wait until it finishes, okay? Better for your health that way. I think half the reason why I need glasses is because I've looked at too much flashing uh, over the years in photography. In photography, just to make that clear. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to uh, now use those images, which I took exactly the same image before we came on and did the, did the broadcast. So I've got exactly the same raw images sitting on my computer. So I am just going to close down a series of images that I had all floating around in the background there that I showed you so you don't see any messy desktops and it's a bit easier just a quick uh, one uh, just a quick one before you uh, go on to that bit paul yeah. says if you were looking for a macro lens for for a crop sensor which is a nikon dx yeah what would be the focal length the ideal focal length you would choose and why go for that one so I mean, ultimately, you're probably going to look at, be looking at somewhere around 100 mil anyway, because that's generally the sort of standard macro length that comes into play. Um, so ultimately, yeah, 100 mil is probably what you're going to be looking for. Um, just because that's kind of where they come from. I mean, I feel really lucky that the 60 mil converts into 120, which is longer. Now, the longer you go, the more compression you get in terms of the image. And what that means is the shallower your depth of field will be. Uh, so on a wide angle lens, f2.8 gives you quite a lot of depth of field. 
but on a 300 mil lens, f2.8 gives you virtually no depth of field, and it's about that compression. So the longer your focal length you go, the shallower each individual shot's depth of field will be at its widest. I always remember them saying about the 100 mil um, Canon macro lens being also yeah. good for portrait portraiture. So Paul said, is there, a, is there a specific focal length? that's recommended for portrait work because you do portrait work as well yeah absolutely i mean i wouldn't work with anything less than um for portrait work i would be working at at, at least <clears throat> at least a 50 mil but more often than not i actually probably would use a lot longer so my preferred olympus lens is the equivalent of a 90 mil um, and it would either be a 1.8 version or a 1.2. It's the 45 mil Olympus length or in, in a 1.2 or a 1.8. That equates to a 90 millimeter. 85 is the usual kind of historical portrait lens, 85 millimeter on a full frame, round about there, uh, which is why I like the 90, but I have also shot on the 40 to 150 at 150, and that creates beautiful compression. The only thing you need to think about with portraits is that the wider the angle, the more uh, triangular the face shape is going to be. So <clears throat> we don't actually have triangular faces. We have slight points here, and then they're fairly oblong as it comes around here. If you shoot on a wide angle, you get this distortion where the chin is thinner and the top of the head is bulbous. Um, and that's not normal. That's why we look a bit weird. If you take a selfie with a smartphone, it's got quite a wide angle lens on it. Uh, the, the, the narrower the angle of the lens, the more natural the face looks. So around 85 to 90 millimeters is considered very aesthetically pleasing. Uh, and the more you go, the more compression you get. And that forces your background out of focus as well. So if you want to hit a nice, consistent focal length, 85 to 90 millimeters is really nice. But it does mean that you can use things like the Canon 100 mil macro for portraits because it's round about there. You know, and I would use the Olympus 60 millimeter uh, as a portrait lens as well at 120, because again, really nice compression. Just don't yeah. go wide. Not yeah. not a good for anyone. The uh, one question came in, but it's been answered by another member about uh, does the in-camera stacking produce a final raw image? But of course, it's only a JPEG, isn't it? That is right. In-camera is going to produce your final JPEG. It does preserve the original rules, though. So if you didn't, if you weren't happy with the JPEG output, you could take the original rules and put it into software, as I'm about to do now. Yep. Thank you. Okay, so let's look at the software. It's a really nice, simple one. There are lots out there. I've used a few. Helicon Focus, or Helicon Focus, as some people call it. Uh, Zarine Stacker, they're all quite popular ones. I use uh, Helicon Focus because it's simple. I'm a simple guy. I don't do complicated at all. Um, so Helicon Focus looks a little bit like, if I can bring it up, looks a little bit like this. Uh, and it's a really, really simple process to use. So you've got <laughs> various icons at the top here. Uh, you've got add files, uh, you've got render, you've got share to Facebook, it's pretty simple. I only use the rendering tab, I don't use the retouching, the text scale or the saving tab here uh, because I do all of my retouching and everything else in other editing software. So I'm in the rendering tab and I need to add some images, I can either add them from there or there's a little add icon down here as well. So we'll click add just there. And then that will bring me into a folder, which is just here. I just need to move something around on my screen because otherwise I can't see it. Perfect stuff. Uh, and this is going to show me all my raw files. Now, I can input raw files, and the program is going to spit out a DNG or a digital negative file, which is what I then work with in either Lightroom or Capture One. So I'm going to select all of those files that it took. This one, I think it was 25 files that I selected earlier. And I'm going to just click Open on that, and it just pops them into that right-hand little package bar there all in a line. Now at any point you can go through these images. If you click on them, it will show you the exact image. And all I tend to do when I look at these is I check the first one to make sure that I got my initial focus point nicely at the bottom. And then I skip down to the last one. Um, oh, I just need to take that one out because that's already a DNG. Um, and then I check the last one to make sure that it hits it all the way up at the end. And that one actually super, it went over the edge. I didn't even need that one. So we can take that one out and then look at the next one. Didn't need that one, take that one. And there we go. We just start to get focused at the top. So always ditch ones that are too far out of focus. You don't need them. And it'll only create weird halo artifacts if you include them in the stack. 
Uh, now, I just go down now to my rendering method. It's got method A, B, or C, weighted average, depth map, or pyramid. And I found that depth map is, is the better one to use. I do a 5% radius on it, uh, not 5% radius, sorry, a 5 on the radius uh, slider down here and a 2 on the smoothing, not too much, and just pretty much leave it at that. And then nice and simple, here I click render. And once it starts to render, it will split the screen. You'll see your original image coming up on the left and this really weird kind of linear uh, artifacted image on the right. And that's perfectly normal because it's scanning through for contrasting points to match the focus up. Uh, and then down at the bottom, you've got a little progress bar that's just going across here. So it's telling me there, it says B52, which means that I chose method B and it's doing five radius on the slider and two smoothing. And it'll just whiz through. This is going to be a really nice quick stack because it's only approximately 22 images because I took a couple out anyway. Just a quick um, one, just a quick one whilst that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Graham's just said, is this a free copy or a buy it, a one cost only, or is it subscription? That's a really good question, Graham. Uh, so you can get a 30-day trial of Helicon Focus, which is what I did a couple of years ago. Um, and it's free. You don't even need to put any details in. It's just an expiry by code after 30 days. And I realized very, very quickly that I needed this software. So once the 30-day trial had finished, I paid £31 for a year's license. Uh, and it's £31 per year. Now, there are three different levels of Helicon. There's Helicon Lite, Helicon um, something else, I can't remember, and then Helicon Pro. Now, if you're an Olympus user or if you're a user of any camera that automatically brackets for you and you're just loading the shots in, you only need Helicon Lite, which is about 30 quid. If you're not and you want uh, Helicon, oh, Helicon Remote is the other one. If you want the other services, they contain software that will control your automatic macro rail as well. Okay, now I don't need that because I'm lucky enough to have a feature within my Olympus camera that does it all for me. So I get away with just Helicon Lite for £30 a year. But definitely do the 30-day trial. Because if, you, if you're into it and you like it, it's so simple. Uh, and as you can see, it's there. It's finished already doing those 20 shots. Um, hopefully that answers Graham's question. Yep, just the second part that he's just dropped into that. He's experienced a few artifacts within the in-camera stacking on his Olympus. Is too that because shots. he's probably taken too many shots for the subject? Yeah. So too, too many shots. It means if he's getting this weird haloing around there, it means that the last two or three or even more shots were completely unnecessary and that subject was wildly out of focus and therefore swells around the original image when it tries to stack it. So try just using less shots. Only use the, the amount of shots that you need and it's the same for the in-camera stacking as it is for the, the, the way that I'm doing it here in Helicon Focus as well. Uh, if you use too many shots, you're going to get weird artifacting. Lovely. Thank you. Okay, so this is all done. You can see there on the left, that's the, fi uh, the first image that we start with. On the right, that's the final image. You can see it's nicely all in focus now. Now I can just click on that and have a quick magnify in just to have a quick look. It's only a, a very basic view on that. Uh, but I need to save that, so it's going to save it as a DNG. So all I want to do is I want to go down to the save icon just down here. Like I said, it's nice and simple. Save icon there. Uh, and then all I want to do is give it a title, which we'll call it... Uh, Feather, uh, down. there we go. Oh, and I'm typing on, <laughs> on the wrong laptop. Typing on the wrong laptop. And this is what happens when you have <laughs> one laptop in front of you, is that you type on the wrong one. Uh, okay, so, and I'm going to save that in uh, a folder that I already set up as raw stacks. So just click save there. Okay, so that's a DNG image that I can then put into my chosen editing software. All right, and that chosen editing software that I'm going to use is uh, I'm going to use Lightroom Classic for this one just here. Okay, so that's saved nicely. Now, really worth uh, knowing that when you run Helicon Focus, it is very memory intensive. Okay, so if you finished a stack before you move on to another one, close the program, reopen the program. Um, and that will have cleared the memory cache. If you don't do that and you're stacking several subjects, by the time you get to your third subject, that will be so slow, it will burn through your entire system and just make nothing happen. So for every subject, close the software, reopen it again. It's nice and simple. Okay. Why, why use DNG? That's what the software spits out. That's oh. the 
the format yet. Yep. So you can input uh, raw files or, t or, or TIFF or anything else like that, but the, the output file is a DNG. Right. It's a compression of all that data from so many raw files. It's still a very good file. So, uh, right, so let's uh, go to Lightroom. So Lightroom Classic, here we go. That's the one. Yep, here we go. So let's do that. And let's pull that image in there that we just had. Uh, import that one from our raw stack. Let's go to me. And I'm pretty sure I put it on the desktop somewhere. I normally run with an external hard drive attached. I haven't done it tonight just to make sure that everything works quite nicely. Um, so I would normally have direct access to um, that external hard drive, which would just pop up automatically in my Lightroom. Uh, so what do we call it? We called it done on feather, didn't we? So let's find that in there somewhere. There it is, the first one. Let's have that in there and import it over and then go to the develop section. And I don't really do a lot after that. I mean, I try to get it all right with the lights and things when I'm doing like the diffusion tunnel and things like that. Um, and I've just got a message saying the image appears to be damaged. Uh, that's not the case. <laughs> I can assure you we definitely don't have a damaged image. So then the only thing that I'm going to do is here in here is I'm just going to raise the exposure uh, ever so slightly. I'm going to pull back the highlights just because of those, uh, the way that those iridescent feathers respond. And I'm going to give it some saturation just to bring back that nice color uh, that that gives a little bit of vibrance. I don't really need to do much else to it. Let's have a quick look at how it looks close up. It looks very nice all the way through. I don't have any blurred sections. Uh, blurred sections would be a telltale sign that I hadn't bracketed properly and I hadn't inputted the right differential and that comes when programming bracketing and that's kind of a whole other section. Uh, blurred lines are something that you would definitely need to look into uh, but it all looks pretty nice to me. Um, maybe I just I'd go into the individual saturation levels, pull in the blues, uh, pull in the yellows and pull in the greens just to make it that nice kind of crisp look. Um, and then then that would probably be it because I don't really think it needs much else doing to it at all. Then I would just save it as it is. And I think I've already done that here. So if I just stop the share there, um, I will open up what I did as a final image because your exported image always looks slightly different anyway. Uh, you do tend to get output sharpening uh, that happens on the way out as well, particularly through Lightroom. And there we go. So that would be the final image. Uh, nice detail in the feather. You, in fact, so sharp that it actually it's difficult for you to render on some screens. Uh, I'm looking at it on two different screens here, and it looks superb on the MacBook, and, it, and it's different on the PC uh, monitor. But that would then be your final product, a fully stacked Peacock feather. Oh, that's lovely. Um, Graham's yeah. just asked another question. Will um, Workspace, Olympus Workspace, read the DNG files okay? Um... I haven't, to be honest with you, I don't know. I haven't tried it. Um, I can't see why not, because it's it's a pretty standard format, like TIFF and JPEG. Um, yeah. But I would have to try it. So I can't give you a definitive yes or no on that one. Um, but I can't see a reason why not. Right. Yep. No, that's fair enough. So, Graham, try it and report back to us all. <laughs> Obviously, bear in mind that Workspace has a stacking function as well. So for smaller stacks, up to sort of 60 or 70 images, then I, I absolutely would use Workspace. Um, but Helicon is for more intense stacks, you know, into the hundreds. Right. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Um, let me pull that down. Um, that kind of concludes what I kind of had for you, uh, really. Um, just looking back, I just wanted to show you a couple more examples of images before I go, just non-macro images, uh, just to show you the other things that I love about the cameras. Uh, first one's a bit a bit silly. So this is me using uh, live composite, which is the light painting feature that gives me output in RAW uh, to create something uh, quite interesting, quite silly, a fully light painted image 
uh, with a few bits and pieces going in the background. Um, and this was just a bit of fun that I did for one of the workshops that I ran on Live Composite. Um, in the same workshop, we, uh, we we started off with the the Star Trek, uh, sorry, the Star Wars thing. <laughs> don't don't tell any of my friends. I just said Star Trek and not Star Wars. I get shot. Um, <laughs> We started off with a fun Star Wars theme, uh, and then we moved on to something that would be considered a little bit more kind of uh, serious. Uh, and we took um, this image here. Whoops, it's not sharing properly. Bear with. Um, let's have a look. There we go. And then, it, and then we took this image here, which again is fully light painted as well. So this is a, this is complete control over the light to light paint a, a product, in particular tricky product that's quite sort of reflective uh, and silvery and things like that. Um, so that's another one of the things that I love doing, and, and it's a really easy way to do uh, with the with the Ollie features. Uh, and then finally, portraiture uh, will always be a favourite of mine. Um, and I actually did, it was the last camera club evening I did before we all got locked in our houses. Um, and it was a one light, one light portrait photography, um, uh, with the Ollie 45 mil 1.8. Um, and I really, really enjoyed doing this cause it was single light. I love working with single lights, uh, single light, uh, flash studio flash 45 mil 1.8. Uh, nice, simple um, portrait photography. Uh, and that's it. That's everything that I have to show you this evening. That's great. Thank you very much, David. The um, I must admit, of recent, a lot more members are looking into and doing the black and white. Mm. Um, really like shows up. Such a beautiful way to represent people as well. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Uh, you know, it really does work well. Um, just a couple of things. One, Michael, who um, got he's got the new M5 Mark III, is just saying, can the stacking be done in camera with his M5? EM5 Mark III can do focus stacking in camera. It will only do eight shots. You don't get a choice over how many shots it does. You just need to switch focus stacking on, and then the number of shots underneath will be grayed out because you just it does eight shots. You just have to bear in mind that you'll need to use a compatible lens. So not all lenses will do focus stacking. So you need to use a macro lens, either the 60 or the 30, or uh, the 12 to 40 Pro, the 40 to 150 Pro, the 300 mil Pro, or the 12 to 100 Pro. Lovely. But yeah, it will do it. Even the EM5 Mark II with the firmware upgrade will do it again, but limited to eight shots. Right. Um, lots of remarks coming in, David. Thank you very much for the evening. Fantastic evening. Learned a lot. Uh, interesting evening, etc., etc. So. Um, You're very welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me along. It's been lovely to chat to you all. For the members who haven't, um, who have got the Olympus but who hasn't had a one-to-one -one with an Olympus uh, specialist like David, by all means, get on it, because I know 40 minutes goes just like it was five minutes, but you learn so much during it. So do get into that. If you want to know about it, you're still doing them, aren't you, David? Yeah, we're still doing the virtual one-to-ones. Uh, they just need to head along to the Olympus Image Space website and click uh, virtual one-to-ones and they can uh, apply from there. And give us a couple of days to get back in touch with you, but we'll give you a call to set up uh, the time and date. Lovely, that's great. So yeah, lots of um, thank yous coming in. So thank you very much, David. Thank you for having me. a great evening. Oh. And I must admit, as I've said to you, we've met quite a few times. I learn something new every time and... I Good. have done again tonight, so thank you very much indeed. I'm so glad. Uh, you're very welcome. If anybody needs anything uh, in terms of Olympus, then uh, I, you are welcome to give them my email address that you have there, Graham. Uh, like I said, and don't forget, if you want to do the one-to-ones, we are still doing them. They're not changing anytime soon, so just uh, get a heads up. Equally as well, it's really important if you're not an Olympus user, but you want to spend 40 minutes talking to one of us about you know reasons why if you're thinking about switching then we can do that as well we are just there literally to chat to you about ollie stuff so yeah anything you like lovely thank you very much indeed no right. problem at all. to the members thank you very much this evening for uh, joining myself and david uh, next week is your night because all of your six images that you've sent in 
uh, we'll be looking at those with your comments and I'll be reading out your comments and we'll have a good look at those so see you next week uh, 10 to 7 as usual thank you very much for joining us this evening bye for now cheers bye